Okay, this is the fourth lecture, and we're going to pick things up a little bit here because we have a, a philosopher that uh, I came in contact with in college through pamphlets, and so this is someone I really enjoy, and I hope that, uh, that you'll uh, get something out of this, uh, this lecture. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Herbert Marcuse. Uh, again, like Sartre, we're talking about an intellectual who becomes a, a pop cultural figure. I mean, this is a very rare thing for a German philosopher to have their picture on the cover of Life magazine, but this happens with, uh, with Herbert Marcuse in the 60s. The reason it does, and, and this time I will go into the theory. In the case of Sartre, there's so many periods and stuff to follow out. It's difficult, but with Marcuse, there are a series of guiding themes that we can follow that I think will explain why Marcuse was the philosopher of the 1960s. And I also want to explain that it's more than that, that Marcuse also caught a certain contradiction or crisis that was, that was always in the heart of modernity, if you like that phrase, of modern life, of the world after capitalism, of the world after rationalization, you know, after bureaucratization, after you have bureaucracies and rational decision procedures everywhere. Marcuse catches a certain contradiction here that I think is, is absolutely vital for us to understand. If we go back to the traditional intellectual's way of looking at it, uh, you, the familiar phrase for the rise of the modern world is the Enlightenment, right? The Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment wants to free the human mind from superstition and from dogma, from the adherence to prejudice. This is the goal of the Enlightenment, beautifully stated by Kant in his essay, What is Enlightenment?, when Kant says, dare to use your own reason, which already, you know, tells you that church fathers and things like that aren't, you know, don't listen to them, dare to use your own reason. Have the audacity to reason for yourself. Well, the Enlightenment's fueled as by the rise of capitalism, it's fueled also by the, the rise and the incredible increase in the power of science and the ability of science to fuel technology, which has been my overall story I've been telling in all these lectures about the self under siege. One of the things we're buried under are oceans of technologies and information systems and so on. Well, the crisis that was always in the heart of the Enlightenment, if you go back and look at it, the crisis that was always working on it was something like this. The attempt to demystify the world, the attempt to make the world, as it were, transparent to reason, carried with it a strange dark side, always. And you may notice this when you watch television now. The more we, as it were, cleared the fields of the traditional religious views, the more that we became convinced that science, and, I, and, and one term for that Marcuse uses is instrumental reason, reason used as an instrument for changing nature and human beings. The more that the Enlightenment project progressed, it simply turned out not to be the case that we became less afraid in the face of the unknown. No, the unknown appeared more terrifying than ever. And it wasn't the case that we became less dogmatic. As a matter of fact, the sciences have now branched out into so many areas that the only way anyone could believe in any of them is dogmatically, since none of us could study them because we don't have world enough or time. So in the paradoxical way, the Enlightenment builds up a kind of intellect intelligent enough to see through mystification. That's where I talked about Marx and Freud and other figures. We build up an intellect hard enough, as it were, to see through these mystifications. But any intellect that powerful has a tendency to become totalitarian. This is the fundamental problem. And nowhere would that be more evident than in, this, in the experience of the Germans, who were a, you know, a great at their technology, the advance in science, and so on. A world as instrumentally rational, you know, 
the famous joke that the trains run on time. But the flip side of enlightenment has been to sort of give up before the overpowering forces of technology in a more abject surrender than any that was ever called for in religion. I mean, to abjectly just to surrender before the powers of technology. And given the current state of the powers of technology, they far surpass the characteristics that we associate with God. I mean, think of it in this simple way. In the, in the Bible, in, in, the, in the book of Revelations, the apocalypse is a magnificent myth, but long ago, it became wh what in our society? A reality, a technologically achievable reality. What had been a myth became a technologically achievable reality. We no longer had to conjure up ten-headed beasts with three thing, winged things to be afraid of. Now we had systems, rational systems, rational in quotes, instrumentally rational. That leads to a further paradox Marcuse locates in modern rationality. And that's that instrumental rationality and I want to associate it with sort of I, atomic bits of if what I've been calling information as opposed to knowledge and, and instrumental singular decisions based upon them. You put these together and the outcome isn't rational. The outcome is irrational and dangerous. Let me give you an example. This is a very clear one. It's... Uh, Work's over, so it's time to go home. It's rational to want to go home after work. On my view of, of, of the good reading of Marxism, that's the most rational thing we want all day, is to get away from work. It's very rational. So each individual actor's decision to run out to their car and get on the freeway is rational. How about the outcome? Well, the outcome is that everybody's sitting on the freeway, breathing each other's smog, sitting on their butt. The outcome is irrational. The outcome of a whole, see, there was no reason. Because the Enlightenment focused upon reason as individuated, individual, atomic, they didn't see that the overall effects of reason working that way might themselves prove to be irrational. Another example I'll give you was the most recent stock market crash. The first stock market crash in the history of the world in which human beings didn't make the foul-ups. No, they had their, you, you can't buy and sell on the stock exchange now because uh, human beings don't make the decisions fast enough. You have computers geared to make the rational decision programs work. The stock market crashed because of the computers making individually rational decisions based on their little bit of information. All working together crashed the market. And it would have crashed further except that we still are able to unplug them. How much longer they will give us that privilege is part of the debate that we'll engage in in the next part of the lectures. We still have the privilege of unplugging them. I think it will, you know, it's a, it's a reasonable conjecture when the uh, decision will work the other way. They will say, to heck with you, we'll unplug you. No, this is, this is why, and I mean, it, you need an answer to this question. Why did the Enlightenment, which began with the love for it, something that I too love, human reason, and with its use to demystify things, how did it itself become a force of mystification? Well, here's another way it did. I've talked about how it debunked religion, but it engaged in overkill. By debunking religion in the way in which it did, it left us open and said science had nothing to do with whole fields of human experience which are now just given over to the wildest kind of insane theories. For example, uh, if you look around now, there's never been a, a period in the history of the world where more people believe more completely nutty things. I mean, just you know, watch a current affair. Elvis is still alive. UFOs landed in Alabama, which always freaks me out. I mean, how come if intelligent beings from another world are going to land somewhere, they don't land in Chicago or Washington, but always in Alabama next to Uncle Billy, you know, who's sitting there going, well, I saw him right over there. It's, no. Land in damn Chicago if you're really a higher intelligence. Land somewhere where somebody can take a picture of you or something. No, they're always some backwater in Alabama or Mississippi. You know? 
anyway, uh, UFOs, uh, poltergeists, uh, oh, see, you couldn't even list all the, all the, uh, the myths in a, in a year. Why? Well, because science marked off this terrain of reason, but outside it, it pays no attention. It gives no guidance. Why are there things outside of instrumental reason at all? That's the theme of the whole course. The self under siege could never find meaning in this denuded form of thinking and living where all that you're up to is making rational decisions one after another. That's not a rich enough notion of experience or human life. So what we have is on the one hand, this sort of enlightenment instrumental reason that is for sure necessary for the sciences and so on. And on the other, the ways in which people today try to get meaning are just incredibly bizarre. Incredibly bizarre. I mean, uh, I'll be moving shortly out to California where I think they have a new religion a week. A religion of the week club, drive-through religions, they worship crystals. And I've talked about these other forms of pseudo-pagan body worship that America now engages in. You know, I mean, uh, there was nothing, there's no concept to skin that, that corresponds to the current concept of skinniness. I mean, you know, I'm a little, I'm a little fat, and in this age, that is a mortal sin, worse than mortal sin. I mean, skinniness is a religion. I mean, we've got lots of, of, of mythic religions. The Enlightenment, in other words, carried myth right along with it. It did not kill it. And it may be that this entwinement of enlightenment and mythology is what is most important to understand about the situation that we're in now. By that I mean in the late 20th century. Because now our technologies are themselves quasi-mythological. Virtual reality. You know, you, you have a movie about virtual reality, a guy gets in a suit, it, enters a world of neural networks and goes, I am God here. You know, this is, this is pretty pagan stuff except for one small thing. They can build these things. You know, otherwise, we'd, we'd be laughing about it except they can build them. And if you don't believe that, they, that the first replicant or cyborg they build will be Elvis Presley, you're already wrong. You know there'll be a lot of money in rebuilding an Elvis. The first cyborg, I, already, I predict today on film, I'll be captured for the ages, the first successful cyborg will be Elvis because you just have him right back to King and probably there'll be a national vote on whether we want to build the young or the old Elvis. I mean, so that, that's the funny part. The unfunny part is that I, I do believe this entwinement of myth and reason is very real. A film that's a classic film that shows it is Dr. Strangelove. A uh, wonderful performance with Peter Sellers, great movie. If you haven't seen it, please see it, directed by Stanley Kubrick, in which one of the most famous examples of rationality under this heading occurs, and that's the arms race. Both sides keep building and building and building and building and building, and every move by one side calls forth a rational move by the other. The only problem is that if it had continued, the outcome would not have been rational. Far from it. Far from it. The outcome would not have been rational. Uh, so that's, uh, mm, sorry. That movie captures that nicely. And uh, let me see if I can come up with one other example, because there, there, there are many, many of these. Uh, The economy is filled with them. Let's take trying to start a union. Let's say you want a union, and, and when American workers used to have them, we had steadily rising wages. We had them for years and years and years. Since we haven't had many unions, we haven't had that. Maybe a connection there, I don't know. But trying to start a union always suffers this problem. You have to transcend instrumental reason to start a union because it's not rational for the first three people to join. You follow me? The first three 
it's not rational. You have to convince them there's a bigger rationality than theirs at stake. Something that transcends their selfhood or they're not, or you haven't got a union. So when, if you don't do that, the total outcome for all the workers is itself irrational. Namely, they are then forced to negotiate against a power greater than themselves at a massive disadvantage rather than to have equals negotiate these things. Again, this is a case where individual instrumental reason left to its own produces irrational results. Now let me give you a classic one that even analytic philosophers know about. It's in game theory. That's something that analytic philosophers love, game theory. It's beautiful for them. It's called the paradox of the downs. Here is the game. You have two sheep herders, and each of them have 100 sheep. And there are downs out there enough to feed 100 sheep. One sheep herder on this side of the game, and the other on this side, and they get to start simultaneously. What is the maximally rational policy to follow? Well, the maximally rational policy, according to game theory, is to drive your sheep onto the downs as fast as possible and have them start grazing. The trouble is that when you both do that, you don't lose 100 sheep, you lose 200. It's a lose-lose game. That's the problem. There you've got two mutually rational actors doing the mutually rational thing, and the outcome is irrational. Now, I've gone through this at some length because this is going to be the heart of a, crit of a criticism of modern technological society that Marcuse will raise. This is at the heart of his criticism. It is not his criticism that our society should just throw away instrumental reason, should just give up on thinking scientifically. That's not it at all. It's that if we don't find a more balanced approach to ourselves, the world, other people, than instrumental rationality, we are lost. So let me run through just a little bit of his basic argument. If you wanted to break it down into uh, so-called worlds, you'd start this way. The inner world we've already discussed, that inner space of the self that Descartes thought he knew all about. Well, we've already discussed the pathologies that arise in the inner self through its contact with what you might call modern life. Uh, and of course, you do that when you study Marx, Freud, and Nietzsche too, but you also do it, we also did it earlier uh, when we discussed uh, uh, Heidegger and Sartre. The inner world is noted, or at least it was, because as we move on into the latter part of the 20th century and into the 21st, it'll be a real question about whether these inner structures are still intact because they have a, both a positive and a negative valence or significance. The inner structures are anxiety, forlornness, nausea, dread, despair, anxiety, and so on. Those are inner structures. Now, again, we have a massive psychology industry to deal with this, and then we, of course, have a society that is massively soaked in drugs. I mean, I don't know how long American society would hold together if it was not a society of addicts. When you think of the leading drugs, and all of them are like either Valium or Prozac, you know, and then the, look at the drugs the kids take, look at ghetto drugs, look at the normal and official drugs, which are very powerful, like alcohol and cigarettes. The truth of the matter is Marx was wrong. Religion is not the opium of the people. Today, opium is the opium of the people. It works better. I mean, opium works better as opium than religion did. So oh, that's, that's, that's the, the inner world. And while it cannot be, the, none of these substances can cure the sicknesses of the self under siege in the late 20th century, but we know what all these things can do. We know it from drinking. They can dull it. They can make you forget it for a while. I mean, my mother was a beautician for years and years, and still is, occasionally. Uh, and she drank a lot, and it was not, she, she really wasn't a drunk. It's just that when you work 12 hours a day, your inner self feels better, numbed a bit. 
So these are not accidental. I'm, again, these are not personal or accidental things. They're quite widespread and social. Uh, a writer about whom you might be interested, who I think even though he's a little crazy, is a good novelist about the society being a society of addicts, is William Burroughs. A, a Naked Lunch is a very strange book, but it has at least one thing going for it, and that's that it shows us as a society of addicts, which I think is, is not entirely unfair. I mean, that, that, that that's, to me is what's silly about the war on drugs. The war on drugs must be just a war on a certain group of people doing it in the wrong way and with too many guns. Because, I mean, I look, sit there and look at the pharmacy and what's going out of it, and I don't know that many people that aren't stoned on something. A handful. And they're, they're what are they doing? Well, they're out eating soybeans and jogging, which I consider even sicker. I mean, if you're doing that, you really need help. I mean, that's when you need to be put on drugs, is when you're out there on, you know, jogging and eating soybeans. You need the damn drugs. Okay, that's the inner world, and, I, and, and for the existentialists, this was, a, this was what they focused on with some of these inner world problems. In the so-called social world, the problems are, and I'll lay them out, and I'll use some of the Marxist terms, alienation. Now, alienation in the Marxist sense is a kind of feeling of separation that is not just a mere mood, it's a structure. It's a separation from your object that you're producing, if it is an object, and nowadays in our economy it's probably not an object. You're probably not doing a damn thing. So then you'd be alienated from nothing. But let's say you're producing a product. It's separation from that product, lack of control over the process of making that product, lack of meaning in making it, and separation from other human beings that come along with that. In short, what Marx means by alienation is the way the relationship between work and money separates human beings from each other, which to me is true, and it, Jesus knew it, and most people that know much about money know it. It's true. It you know, doesn't mean communism's true. It just means that that stuff about money is, is, is right. Rationalization. This is a big word. I'll try to demystify quickly for you. Rationalization... There's a great social theorist you could read here, that's Max Weber, tells a lot about how the more complex governmental and, and private enterprises get, the more they need to bureaucratize and rationalize. But if you really wanted a sense for it, I would tell you don't read Max Weber, read Franz Kafka. Because when you read The Trial or The Castle, you get a real sense for what a bureaucracy feels like, for a world rationalized and the outcome being irrational. See, no one likes bureaucracy either. I mean, you know how it feels. You go, you know, you, you, you've, your income tax return didn't come, so you've got to go get one. They say, well, go to room 107. And you just left room 100, and you show up in room 107, and they say, well, you didn't pick up form B in room 100. Who did you talk to? Well, you don't know them personally. You know, you're not asking them, did you talk to me? Do you know who I am? Do you know who you talked to? I mean, you get that on the phone from IT, from, you know, the telephone company will go, what operator did you speak with? And I go, ma'am, I'm not personally acquainted with all of them. I don't, ha I don't know who the hell I talked to. But no, this is the Kafkaesque quality of life as we emerge into the 21st century. You know, it, it, it's an adventure to get your, you know, your water hooked up. It's an adventure with madness like this, with utter madness. And we're here, you know, very close to Washington, D.C., where I don't need to explain this at all. There are agencies over there where people who have just come in with the new administration haven't found the bathroom key yet and are still holding their water. And it will be months before they find it. Ross Perot will be president before they find their bathrooms. And by then it will be too late. <laughs> no, I don't. I'm having fun. I'm sorry. I should, we shouldn't have fun when we do this. Anyway, there's, there's rationalization. And I want you to know both of these come along with modern life. And again, if you don't like these arguments that I'm drawing from Marcuse, look at Charlie Chaplin movies. Look at modern times and notice how when it was made, people could still laugh at the way Chaplin's motions matched the motions of the times because people could remember they didn't always move like that. 
Now we'll rent modern times and we'll look at it and go, boy, I wish we moved slow like that now. Because, I mean, now it looks real slow. He's just going with the machine. He's not having to run with all these flows of data or anything. He's, he got caught a, he caught a break and didn't know it. Anyway, that's rationalization. And then the third, and this is sort of one of my own, if you'll forgive me, is what I'll call banalization. And it's always a danger when you do lectures like the ones I'm doing now. And that's to take uh, these fundamentally important things like what does my life mean, and surely there must be a better way to organize the world than the way it's organized now. Surely my life could have more meaning in a, in a different situation. It, maybe my life's meaning might be to change it or whatever. But to take any one of these criticisms and treat them as banalities. This is the great, to me, ideological function of television and the, and the movies. However extreme the situation, TV can find a way to turn it into a banality. Let me give you an example. Uh, and it's an old TV show. You won't even have to go that far back. Laverne and Shirley. Laverne and Shirley work in Milwaukee in a beer factory. Now, I would expect that to be a socialist realist film. No, no, it's a sitcom. They've got two friends that are stupid and ugly. They dress funny. Their life is shit, if you'll pardon the expression. And this is a comedy. Because all the troubles that such a life involve are just reduced to banality. Just the common rubble of little one-line jokes. You follow me? It's made banal by it. It's banalized that way. And I don't want to jump on my good friend Oliver Stone, but he makes a film that claims, and it may not be false to claim this, that, that John F. Kennedy was killed in a coup d'etat. And our government's been run secretly ever since, and that may be true. But by the time we've had 10,000 books and 4,000 movies, it's become banal. We have rock groups called the single bullet theory. You know, just sort of making fun of how you can take matters of ultimate human importance and turn them into banality. Now, again, another example, and I don't want to sound like Tipper Gore here because I've got nothing against rock and roll music. Of course not. I mean, I'm talking about a 60s writer, and I'm not against that. But, I mean, we've got all these lyrics about Satan, well, you know, in heavy metal. Here we take the Prince of Darkness, man, I mean, the Lord of Evil. I love this guy. You know, he's the guy, the character from Paradise Lost. And now he's just more banal rubble for MTV. He's Ozzy Osbourne, you know? And I'm sorry, but Ozzy Osbourne just doesn't make it as Satan. I cannot see one of those lead singers fighting the infinite being and creator of the world in dubious battle upon the plains of heaven. No, they've banalized that. You know, in other words, there's no area of human experience that you couldn't find that they haven't reduced to some form of banality. So that's a third uh, thing, and I think the banalization is important, uh, especially if you think of a couple of the cases I've used. The banalization is important. Let me give you another one where I think it's uh, very important. We have uh, the problem of AIDS and changing sexual mores. So, uh, the, if, if my principle of banalization is right, how would a, a rational apparatus react to that? by talking about it so much, about sex, with your mom, with your dad, with your brothers, with your sisters, with your uncles, aunts, and da, 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 da. transsexuals, multisexuals, polysexuals. You'll just talk about it until the whole subject will become banal. And what, what used to be fascinating desires, interesting, important, strange, hidden, prohibited parts of the psyche, what Freud called the unconscious, now, those are just topics for Geraldo. I mean, Geraldo could literally go through some of the sort of sick cases Freud refused to write up, and he'd have his list of shows for a month. So this is the process I call banalization. And again, it's not irrational. If you ask them, what are they doing? They're journalists shedding the light on this problem. Like Phil Donahue always says, I'm, you know, Society needs to know about these 
people who, uh, you know, don't know whether they're men and women in dress and like gorillas and live in the Himalayas and come down once a year to have uh, mating rituals with fir trees. I mean, they've got to know. This needs to be, you know, how the, the light of enlightenment needs to be brought upon this problem. Well, banalization, okay, so those are, those are the sort of uh, what I'd call anomalies of the sort of social world. The real question I'm asking here is, is the one Marquis asked in the 60s. How does a, a way of life break down? How does it break down? And Marquis doesn't give the pat Marxist answer, which means economically. And we ought to be glad that that pat Marx, Marxist answer is false. Because if a, a society could, uh, uh, could be driven to ruin by debt, the way we, you know, a lot of people said the Russians uh, uh, the Soviet Union fell because it was broke. Let's hope that's not true. <laughs> you know, since we're broke, let's hope that's false. <laughs> As a generalization, we better hope it's false. How, does it, who do they, how do they break down? Well, here there's an analogy for me between the social and the self under siege. In many ways. In many ways, not in a few. And uh, some of the symptoms that we see around us that our own lives are breaking down in the life of our society is a generalized cynicism and skepticism about everything. I don't know how to characterize this situation. I find it no parallel to it in human history. The skepticism and cynicism about everything is so general and I think it's partly due to this thing I've called banalization, and it's partly due to the refusal and the fear of dealing with complexity. Much easier to be a cynic than to deal with complexity. Better to say everything is bullshit than to try to look into enough things to know where you are. Better to say everything is just silly or pointless than to try to look into to systems of this kind of complexity, into situations of the kind of complexity and ambiguity that we have to deal with now. So anyway, that, that's one way in which a society can break down. My own view of the United States government is that it has no legitimacy now in the classical political sense. That means it is not supported by a democratic majority of its people. It has no classic political legitimacy. I mean, I take that to be an empirical fact. I bet you could probably do a factoid on CNN about it and banalize it. You go, oh, well, big deal. So what? Well, so what? You, got, you don't have a damn democracy. You've been lied to since you were born. Well, that's no problem. We're used to it. That's cynical reason at work. I mean, I mean, it's just utterly the situation that I think we're finding ourselves in. This skepticism includes the skepticism concerning history and this has not been a diatribe up here against reason. It's been a diatribe against instrumental reason. Clearly, the uses of a more comprehensive reason to try to figure out where we are would be important and could be used, but there's a general cynicism about it. Marcuse is an old-fashioned guy from the 60s. He still thinks, and I, I have no way to defend him now, too much has happened. Too many things have gone wrong. But Marcuse still thinks that human beings as a species have historically accumulated potential. Over history, they've accumulated a potential to live a life with a good deal more freedom and a good deal more happiness and solidarity than the one they live now. In fact, Marcuse, unlike philosophers, is an unashamed advocate for this project. Philosophers don't enjoy being advocates for any positions that matter, usually, but Marcuse is, in this case, an advocate for this position. <coughs> His style of criticism, and that's, this is a, not a method, and it's one that I use myself frequently, it is more like a style of criticism and here I've got to use a technical term, is imminent critique, internal critique. That word is imminent, I, with an I, imminent critique. 
What imminent critique does, I'll give you an example, but what it does is it takes historically accumulated concepts and then measures the society against those concepts that have been developed within it, which is what I was just doing by saying these are the following maladies of our society and they shouldn't be, we should be happier and so on and so on. You know, this is a society with happiness, liberty and all that, or it's supposed to be. So imminent critique takes the, the, the historically accumulated concepts, for example, the Bill of Rights tradition, and it confronts them with the historically existent reality to measure the gap between the practice and the promise. You are all familiar with this style of critique because it's, for example, Martin Luther King's paradigmatic style of critique, right? I mean, Martin Luther King was, didn't say, look, I'm a Maoist. That's why we should have civil rights. No, it wasn't because he was a Maoist. It was because that there was a, a gap between the practices we engaged in and our promises. Now, that's the method within which Marcuse cap, uh, criticizes even capitalist society. Not with external norms drawn from some utopian situation, but by its own terms, with its own terms. I also think that that's not only a good strategy as a style of critique, but it's utterly fair. I mean, in a way, it's like demanding of yourself that you do what you say, you know, which you want to demand at least of your friends, that they do most of the time what they say they'll do. But it's certainly a good demand to place upon uh, your society, its leaders, and so on. The trouble is, is that just as I've stated before, we are blocked. We're blocked in a way by an unprecedented structure of what I have called here sort of cynical, skeptical reason. That it's just, to me, it's historically unmatched. I've never read or heard of a period like this one, and I've read about many historical periods, but not one in which you can talk to young people the way you can at the college level today and find out that they believe nothing, want nothing, hope nothing, expect nothing, dream nothing, desire nothing. Push them far enough and they'll say, yeah, I got to get a job. Spend a lot of money at Duke. That's not what I'm talking about here. They hope nothing, expect nothing, dream nothing, desire nothing. And it is a fair question to ask whether a society that produces this reaction in its young is worthy of existence at all. It really is. It's worth asking that whether it's worth being here at all. And my criticism of this society couldn't get more bitter than it is in that case. It couldn't possibly be. Remember, I'm talking about the young I've encountered at Duke. These are privileged youth at an elite southern school, mostly white, mostly upper, to, upper middle class to upper class. Now, imagine what the attitudes are like in the streets of D.C. if you're from another race or another social class. We have outlived in the 20th century the responses that Marcuse would have given to this. I still admire, and I, uh, in his book, The Argument Concerning Enlightenment. I still admire his vicious attack on a uh, bureaucracy, both here and in the Soviet Union and elsewhere and his attack on a world in which money comes before human beings. That to me is the sort of one-line essence of the critique of Marx, I mean of Marx's critique, where money is placed ahead of human needs, where just money is placed ahead of it. Marcuse still tries to defend, uh, as I say, freedom, happiness, creativity, he still believes in the truth. He still believes the human race has a happy destiny. I mean, I think that we have to look back at Marcuse, who at the time we looked at as a vicious radical. 
I think we have to look back at him as a kind of Norman Vincent Peale of the 60s. I mean, Marcuse wasn't radical at all by the standards of this world into which we have slipped by the late 20th century. No, he really does sound like Norman Vincent Peale at times. It's, it's, uh, it's almost uh, quaint if it wasn't so horrifying. Because his meditation and his, I'm mean, not meditation, his theory and his view is about the destiny of the human race on this planet, about whether we will ever learn to make sense or whether we'll just keep making money and madness. It's a real big question. He never was able to answer it. But one of the reasons I wanted to raise it right in the middle of the lectures is I didn't want these lectures to turn into some kind of funky kind of Tony Roberts course in self-development. Like, now I know who I really am kind of crap. Because we, when we're through, we won't know. I don't know. If I had known who I was, I probably wouldn't have shown up. Now, I mean, you know, this is not, I mean, it's an important part, and it's not a cynical thing to say, but it's an important part of our, of, of finding out about the self in this part of the, in this part of history that we don't have all the answers, that we have not even formulated all the questions correctly. In fact, Tony Roberts and people like him are a part of the problem themselves, their banalization. I love it when I hear someone say, I've listened to Tony's tapes and now I used to be fat and unhappy and now I'm skinny and happy. Well, it just makes me want to cut someone up with a chainsaw. I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, no, you know, that's not why humans think. They think because they have to think. It's, an, it's, it's, a, a, it's a felt necessity. It's the weight of the world, the complexity of it. And you can avoid it, I admit, with drugs, but at some point in your life you have to come across the need to think. Marcuse was, uh, comes from a period, and it's back in style, in fashion. I have to admit it. The 60s are back in style. Everyone... They probably will be out of style by the time these tapes are out, but people are back listening to Jimi Hendrix, wearing bell-bottoms and tie-dyes. I suppose you've noticed that. Of course, this would have nothing to do with banalization. <laughs> well, of course it would. Because anything that's, there, that's a threat to this system can be banalized. I, I, I'll give you two examples in the sphere of politics. The way they turned Jesse Jackson from a serious social actor into sort of a banal caricature of himself in the media. They've banalized a real threat to the system, which was the Rainbow Coalition. A real threat, populist threat to the system, banalized into a joke. It's even sicker to realize this, that if uh, something tragic happened to Jesse Jackson, there'd be a picture of him up next to Malcolm X and Martin Luther King in all our schools ten years from now. No one doubts it, see? But now, while he's alive, he has to be banalized. This is, a, it is obviously a form of control. It's social control I'm talking about here. It's not a conspiracy. I mean, it's just something that happens in the process of a society working out its own internal logics in systems of incredible complexity. Banalization is a way to reduce complexity. It's also a systematic way to be an idiot. And I have to say this, many of our complaints about the educational system fall under the critique of Marcuse as well, where we produce student after student in this condition I've described, which is not really despair because it's beneath that level. In other words, they'd have to be more excited to be in despair. They'd have to be like more thrilled to be forlorn. Like they'd have to be in love with something before they could have their heart broken to make a more simple example out of it. No, it's, it's beneath that level. It's frighteningly beneath it. It cannot be defended. Herbert Marcuse, while he lived, uh, uh, made these arguments, and as I say, looking back on, on them from this point in history, from this point in time, it's hard not to feel a little nostalgic for them, but I have a feeling that they'll come back along with tie-dyes, Jimi Hendrix, and who knows, they may even have someone like me tour 
and denounce the system as the warm-up act for a rock and roll band. I mean, who the hell knows? But uh, that's uh, all I have to say about Marquesa, and I've really enjoyed this little interlude with you, and I, I hope that we, uh, we got somewhere in this hour anyway. Thank you uh, very much.